Dear listeners, dear speakers, good evening. On behalf of the House of European History team, a warm welcome to this evening's debate, which we have organized a few day, uh, days after 23rd of August, which is the European Day of Remembrance for Victims of Stalinism and Nazism, and at the same time, the International Slave Trade Remembrance Day. What of our history should remem we remember and what should we forget? Every community, every country, every family, every individual would answer this question differently. There are historical and personal events that we like to remember and others we prefer to forget or cause to be forgotten. Memories are subjective. They can change with the context, they can be manipulated and they can motivate revenge, but also reconciliation. At the level of a whole continent, the question about memory and oblivion is even more difficult to answer. Is there such a thing as European collective memory? Can we agree on a common methodology of remembering? Some reactions to the House of European History's permanent exhibition, amongst a lot of praise for this first transnational view on European history in a museum exhibition, show how divided and divisive memories can be, even when it comes to shared events. These reactions to our exhibition are an expression of a memory competition between different victim groups, some of whom have claimed they should have received more space or a different representation of their sufferings in our exhibition. The exhibition, as you can see it in Brussels, has tried to strike a delicate balance between the sufferings of the victims of Nazism of, and Stalinism, of other dictatorships, and to a lesser extent of colonialism and slavery. The House of European History uses the concept of memory in its exhibitions as a critical framework to address issues such as the impact of history on the present and the diversity of perceptions related to one and the same historical event. We juxtapose various ways of dealing with difficult pasts between late recognition, silence, distortion of facts, long time repression, or even the punishment of those who want to remember. Our museum is therefore a perfect place to connect, confront and compare different memories. Instead of merely stating the existence of memory competition and memory conflicts, it allows also to question the impact of different memories upon each other. As one of our speakers this evening has argued, the intensified memory of the Holocaust, for example, has facilitated articulating other memories. On the other hand, bringing one memory to the forefront can mean less attention dedicated to another one, for example, uh, to the memory of slavery. It follows from the above that the concept of multidirectional memory or in, in its French interpretation of nœud de mémoire of the impact of memories upon each other is a very relevant one for anyone looking at the past from a European perspective as we do it in our museum. Can we conceive Europe as a reflective space in which we discuss the multidirectional impact of memories on each other and strive to achieve a common methodology of remembering? How can Europe integrate the memory of colonialism and of slavery into its narratives? I am confident that tonight's debate will bring us closer to an answer. And therefore, I would like to extend a warm welcome and many thanks to all the speakers, which will now be introduced by the moderator. And I wish you all a very inspiring and fruitful debate. Thank you very much for your attention. Markus, over to you. Thank you very much, Constanze, for your words of introduction. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to moderate today's online debate revolving around the overarching question of how European historical memories in the plural interrelate. More particularly, how can distinct and even diverging memories interact productively rather than being in competition to each other? And secondly, how can historical memories contribute to addressing contemporary political and social challenges rather than further aggravating or even escalating them? I'm also glad to welcome all our online participants and to present to you our today's three distinguished speakers whose scholarly work sheds light on different aspects of historical remembrance in a European context. Let me start with Simina Badika, 
who is a historian and curator at the House of European History, curator research and then head of the ethnological archives at the Romanian Peasant Museum between 2006 and 2017. She has been teaching museum studies at the National School for Political and Administrative Studies in Bucharest since 2015. She holds a PhD from the Central European University in Budapest on curating communism in post-war and post-communist museums and has published on the memory and memorialization of communism, the representation of communist regimes in museums, as well as everyday life uh, in Romania from an oral hist history perspective. I'm equally pleased to present to you Ruramizai Karumbira. She is a historian and the author of Imagining a Nation, History and Memory in Making Zimbabwe, in which she analyzes competing narratives of the founding of Rhodesia and later Zimbabwe, constructed by political and cultural nationalists, both black and white, since the late 19th century. Articles in peer-reviewed journals and chapters in peer-reviewed edited volumes, including a recent one in Women Warriors, National Heroes, complement her publication record. She's currently working as Associate Senior Fellow at the Walter Benjamin Kolleg, University of Bern, Switzerland, and is founder of TOR, Taking the Humanities on the Road, with colleagues at the Walter Benjamin Kolleg. Last but not least, allow me to introduce Michael Rothberg. He is the 1939 Society Samuel Goetz Chair in Holocaust Studies and Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of California, Los Angeles, and one of the world's most renowned experts in memory studies and Holocaust studies in particular. His latest book is The Implicated Subject, Beyond Victims and Perpetrators, published by Stanford University Press in their Cultural Memory and the Present series in 2019. Previous books include Multidirectional Memory, which Constanze already mentioned before, published in 2009, Traumatic Realism, The Demands of Holocaust Representation, published in the year 2000, and The Holocaust Theoretical Readings, the letter co-edited with Neil Levy. A very warm welcome to all three of you. The work of Simina, Ruramizai, and Michael represents three particularly significant, but not necessarily fully compatible, and partly also divisive historical memories at European level. Michael and Simina, that of the Holocaust and communism, respectively. Rura Misai, that of colonialism, and more particularly, slavery. What demonstrates the sim simultaneity and sometimes competition between different memories is indeed the fact that 23rd of August is not just the European Day of Remembrance for the victims of all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes, but also the International Slave Trade Remembrance Day. This indeed raises the question of the actual role of slavery and colonialism more generally for and within historical memory in Europe. Slavery and colonialism are often considered to be a somewhat underrepresented part of Europe's historical memory today, or even one that is consciously neglected by policymakers and in public discourse. Would you, Ruramisai, share that overall assessment? That would be my first question. Or do you recognize at least some indication for a growing and lasting his historical consciousness in Europe as regards slavery and colonialism? Ruramisai. Uh, you have to turn on your microphone, please. All right, thank you again, and sorry about that. Um, first, of course, I thank everybody who invited me to this, and I thank my co-panelists as well for what I hope will be an engaging uh, conversation. And I want to begin first by acknowledging the Africans, you know, and Black lives both on the continent and around the world, you know, those who lost their lives or whose lives were squandered, to make possible the idea of a modern world, and especially a modern Europe because usually those are usually forgotten, but you know, basically I see it also is they're the people on whose shoulders we stand in order to do even what we do. 
And I also want to acknowledge the uh, indigenous peoples all over the world, you know, whose lives, especially in North America, that I consider home uh, also, who also, you know, whose lives were lost and squandered to make the European project in particular uh, possible. So to that end, I see this also as a conversation both between us, the living, and also the dead, because in many ways, the dead don't, live, don't need history and they don't need memory, but we do, because in many ways, we find ourselves in this long cold shadow that we are all trying to navigate. So in my assessment, and also I have to sort of preface it by saying I'm not a Europeanist. So in many ways, I come at European history from African and global history. So if I sort of miss some of the things, I hope that in the conversation, you know, I can sort of stitch the, the, the missing parts. But I really see in my assessment of my time here in Europe, as well as in reading, I have this sense that Europe, as far as slavery and colonialism uh, is concerned, tends to play the innocence card, right? That as far as slavery is those Americans over there, they are the ones who have issues with this. And as far as colonialism, well, it's the Africans, you know, they are sort of historically subhuman, and most of them live in sub-Saharan Africa, so that the Africans themselves are seen as sort of is an essential problem to the whole idea. So that in some ways, in my assessment, there's sort of an inbuilt idea of European white supremacy does it, that hasn't actually quite left. It's, if you might say, it's a kind of amnesia that you find sort of spread. It's like a thin layer on Europe by and large. And for the most part, there is no conversation about it. So for me, one of the examples I sometimes give to people is even just the quotidian thing like chocolate and coffee, for example, right? There's something called Swiss chocolate and there's something called Belgian chocolate. And sometimes you're like, where are the cocoa trees that actually give us this? And people actually don't think like, where, why do we have Swiss chocolate? Why do we have Belgian chocolate? And why does that matter? It matters because it's the history of colonialism and it's the history of slavery, right? Most of these things became European commodities and European lifestyle commodities, right? It's a way of classing up. It's a way of becoming somebody, if you will. And in many ways, it's also, which was a way of opening up uh, the largesse of what it meant to be European. So that over time, even now, when we think about European countries, most of them, of course, you might say, you know, begin to be real countries in the 19th century. Before that is the kingdoms and so on and so forth. All to say that in many ways, to my mind and to my reading, slavery is one of the ways in which also Europe begins to define itself as European and Europeans over time, because when they're in the colonies, they might go as, is, um, um, well, I'm sort of blanking out on European names, Bavarians, or they might go as Englishmen or Scotsmen or something else. But once they are there, over time, they cease to be Scots or Irish or, 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 or English, and they become white and they become European. So in many ways also, I see slavery as a foundational stone to that. And then colonialism, of course, cements that. And this is not only about Africa, but it's also about all the other parts of the world where the brown people live, right? So that there's the savage of Africa and the noble savage of some other place. So that for me, it's not so much also playing the card of who is worse off than the other, but really to say the foundational stone is European white supremacy that is spread over time. It's not sort of like a hammer that comes. It's sort of very slow and then over time, it becomes this big thing that has really enveloped us all. And in many ways, we are all defined by that. And the fact that we speak about the first woman to do that, the first black person to do that, the first transgender person to do that, speaks to the reality of it's a system that was built to advantage certain kinds of people and to exclude. And the exclusion in and of itself, to my mind, also has the idea of what it also meant to be European. It was also about always this exclusivity. I'll leave it at that and then maybe we'll continue later on. Thank you. Maybe Rura Misai, if I may follow up what you just said, would you, where would you see maybe there, where there is most need for action change, a change of mind? Is it 
on, on, on the side of Europeans, I mean, is it more political acknowledgement of colonialism and slavery as a historical legacy and responsibility? Do we need more educational efforts, for example, by means of curricular reform to pay more attention to this uh, part of Europe's past? Or is it in your eyes really the neglect, is the neglect of colonialism perhaps expression of more fundamental underlying issues such as the latent racism and continued sense of superiority in Western nations uh, about which maybe not too much can be done. So what would be your approach to that? I think all of the above in many ways with the you know, sort of fundamental issue of say speaking of Africa in particular and sort of recent slavery in many ways Part of what I see also with Europe is at least in, with the relation to Africa and people of African descent is this sort of fundamental anti-black racism. You just have to be a black person or a person in a black body and somehow there's something unhuman, subhuman tainted about you, right? You always almost have always to stretch. And even the t-shirt that I'm wearing shares a sentiment that it's in German, you know, that uh, racism is auch ein virus, right? The sentiment you might say is true, but on the other hand, one could argue that a virus is a natural occurring infective agent, but racism is a system that's actually created. So that in some ways, if we say racism is also a virus, yes, the way it spreads and infects people, you might say, but in terms of how it starts, it sort of starts at a very, uh, sort of fundamental level of what it means to be human. And I think for me, uh, sort of thinking about Europeans and Africans in particular, and the ways in which Africans of most people on the planet, really they sort of represented for a long time, maybe not so much now, but for a long time, the sort of Africans represented this idea of being less than, and of course we have Hegel to thank that for, and Immanuel Kant too, you know. So in many ways, these are the sort of the altars and you know, that people, most people worship it. And sometimes people don't even realize because I could call it, I used to do that. Now I don't do that so much anymore because when you say Hegel said this and you sort of repeat it, in many ways you're sort of <laughs> you're sort of ancestor worshiping, right? Because the ancestor said this, I have to repeat it and to remind you. On the other hand, it's true if you don't say it, you know, there's amnesia to that, you know. But for me, it's also becomes important to say. One of the ways that we actually can change this and the ways in which things can shift is to look at the everyday, the quotidian, you know, the sort of very ordinary. When a black person goes into a grocery store, there's a sense of, oh, here comes. But at the same time, in a grocery store, you'll find something like this, right? Everybody has this. But if Uncle Ben, the person came into your, to your house to visit you, there'd be a sense of discomfort, right? But at the same time, we all would like to eat out of that. Or you can get something like that. I'm just gonna show you this, right? So in some ways it's like, there's no racism in Europe, but you can buy things like that today. You know, this is like bought in Switzerland not too long ago, just as an example of the ways in which the kind of thinking, it's so everyday, like the air we breathe, people don't actually see how that, that, that sort of penetrates. So for me, one is the quotidian, the everyday, the ordinary that we need to interrogate, that people need to ask why. It's almost like, you know, you would say to children of drug dealers, for example, if you're living rich and your friends at school don't, you have to ask yourself, what does my parent get the money to do? But in some ways, it's almost like it becomes so comfortable, people would rather not, you know, sort of question that. The other thing would be, you know, sort of curriculum. One of the things that I find very interesting, which you might say is a very good thing in terms of Europe, is the apprenticeship system right that students go to school and they learn some trade or some skill so they can choose then go to university or proceed with their skill what i've also noticed over time and especially living here is that while that's an excellent system the downside of it is that most it doesn't give people the critical thinking re required about the issues of racism and slavery and the ways in which europe is better than everybody else right so that in some ways there's no in the apprenticeship system, the little bit that I know, I'm not saying I know much, but you know, just by observation and seeing, it sort of fosters this idea of amnesia because when you don't engage with the text and that's where the humanities are also very important and hence my, my project that you introduced at the beginning. The other thing also is the ways in which I find 
interesting that Europeans are very keen on, you know, philanthropy or aid to Africa, really, you know, sort of doing uh, the international NGOs, for example. And more often than not, these international organizations or projects really are more geared toward the young people of Europe who see this as a career. So if we say just not going too far, but the last 200 years, people have been going to Africa, for example, to civilize the Africans, to help the Africans, to save the Africans. But by and large, it's sort of in many ways, it sort of dips into the same Hegelian idea, right? Africans don't have a history, they need rescuing and so on and so forth. So that in many ways, it never sort of changes the relationship with. So for me, learning history, both from the everyday life, as well as in school will be an important. And the last one that I would say is that I see also that here in Europe, a lot of people, especially ordinary people are participating in, the, in sort of anti-racist work, right? Ordinary people, that includes those I bought this t-shirt from, people who are really have been doing much of the work for a long time. There've been a lot of Africans here, even from the times of slavery, who lived in this part of the world. So there's that long history as well. And they are a minority group to this day, but in many ways, it's also about how do they become European and are seen as European rather than always the color of your skin defines you as being of quote unquote immigrant background, right? So that in many ways, a European can go to North America, say, get a North American accent and will pass for North American, but an African can be born in Europe and raised in Europe, speak all, you know, whatever European language they have, but in many ways, their skin color is always sort of sort of a smudge on them that says that they don't belong. So I think it really would be a sort of a, if you will, a global way of dealing with it. It couldn't be just policy alone because acknowledgement by Angela Merkel will not solve problems. Acknowledgement by Macron will not solve problems. I think it has to be a much more holistic uh, approach. And I think between Michael and uh, Sadin, excuse me for not saying your name, uh, correctly. I think between the two of them also, we'll also hear the ways in which the history of Europe itself, you know, you know, they would know better than I do how we can sort of complicate that. But as far as slavery and colonialism, I see this as really some of the sort of foundational ideas of what it means to be European, both on the continent and abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. It is indeed so that the Holocaust and communism seem to have been a less contested part of Europe's historical memory. And since the 1990s, one could argue that these are the two dominant memory frameworks of Western and Eastern Europe manifest also in the parallel existence of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day on 27th of January and the before mentioned European Day of Remembrance for the victims of all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes on 23rd of August, which interestingly play a distinctively different role in Western and Eastern European countries. Which makes me ask Simina perhaps how you as a specialist in the communist past of Europe, how you would assess the overall role of communism in Eastern Europe's political and societal context today, and whether you see any tangible shifts perhaps in how this past has been remembered and interpreted since the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Marcus, for your question. I can see that our conversation is going a bit upwards from, uh, let's say, memories that are least acknowledged, and now we are stepping up to, to communism and then the Holocaust, which um, is, uh, in a way, uh, a model for all, uh, all we will talk about. So I will just try to, uh, to explain very briefly how uh, how I see the memory of communism in Eastern and Central Europe and how it has, of course, it has uh, changed over the, the last three decades. And of course, it is uh, crucial to, um, to, the, to, Eastern, East Europe, to Eastern Europe's political and uh, social context. And I would just um, remind you that 
there is a specific word for this time. So this post-1989 time, it is um, a lot of times called post-communism in Eastern Europe. So it's just uh, proves to say, and it has been said before, that to call um, a time period like this, it really means that its relation to the communist past is one of its essential features. So just um, uh, very briefly, I would say that um, one could dis dis distinguish two, uh, two periods of how Eastern Europe has engaged with this communist past, and maybe I can, uh, I can see a third one in the present, but um, I would say that in the early 1990s, um, there was something of um, um, total lack of interest to the communist past. It was what I sometimes call in my uh, research this uh, black hole paradigm. So that the communist past was seen as a black hole, something that, um, that needed to be forgotten, something that needed to be overcome. Everyone was very enthusiastic about the uh, about democracy, about all these new ideas, about free market, about uh, rediscovering Europe. No one wanted to think about communism. And even more, uh, <clears throat> why I sometimes use this metaphor of a black hole or of a void, if you want, is that also the what, um, what happened before communism became very important. So suddenly everyone was looking towards the interwar period with a lot of, um, of hope and expectation to find a, <clears throat> let's say to find the, the, the remnants of democracy there and to find something that is not tainted by communists. Now, the problem is that, of course, as, uh, as you step out of, as you step over the communist period, you end up directly in a pool of fascism, let's say, among many other things, but that's also there. So this is, um, uh, this is one of the problems and we will probably come back to that because that's when um, these memory clashes start to um, start to appear. Now what happened afterwards is the, um, uh, the European integration, uh, which happened in stages. Of course, some countries um, um, could become part of the European sooner, some uh, later. So my, uh, my home country is one of the, the second batch of entries, so we, we did it a bit slower, which also made the um, possible for me to observe the, uh, the process um, a bit better. And this, um, as it has been already observed in man, many um, uh, memory studies and researches, this has uh, confronted um, East European societies and East European intellectuals and historians with this um, great and overarching and unique memory of the Holocaust. So, so there was this, uh, this encounter, which was also um, imposed on the East um, as a, let's say, West European um, memorial framework. Uh, and this, um, this has triggered, um, in a way, not, not only an interest in the communist period, because that would have come, I think, naturally after you overcome this initial uh, amnesia per period, probably it would have happened anyway. But what it triggered is a, a specific memorial framework. So it was, in a way, it's like you are given a recipe. So this is how things are done when you want to acknowledge victims, when you want to gain acceptance for your um, national victimhood. So this is why, um, but again, this is something that we will come back to know the, um, how these memories function in, uh, um, in competition or maybe in com co complementarity. Um, the Holocaust and the um, um, uh, the communist memory, but uh, it is not unusual in this period, let's say, to have um, so alongside official condemnations of the Holocaust in each of these countries that were aspiring to become part of the European Union. So this um, uh, it was a part of the the new values that these countries had to embrace. And then you have uh, following quickly condemnations of communism as a criminal regime. So it's really the same, you establish a commission and you, you, um, you condemn the crimes and the regime. And then in, um, uh, in the Romanian context, for example, at the end of this condemnation of the communist regime, you have the recommendation of the president of Romania to build a museum of communism in Romania, which should take as a model the Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum in Washington. 
and this is really it's really stated in the paper it's um it's out there you don't have to invent connections it's really um this is how um um how how models are are created uh I, I would not go very much into the present day because I'm, I'm not a political scientist and as I go closer to <laughs> to, con, con, to contemporaneity, I feel that I'm um, I'm overstepping my my expertise what what I noticed and I think it's um, um, it's already a different thing um, in the way the communist past is used in public discourse nowadays is um, a new stage in which I would say uh, <clears throat> we go beyond victimhood uh, and there is a sort of um, there is a sort of pride in having been uh, resistant to the communist regime in a way in which you were defending democracy uh, in a way that Western Europeans never had to. So it's this new discourse of uh, unfortunately exactly the countries that are going very undemocratic and very illiberal as they like to say it. so uh, Hungary and Poland mostly that um, are coming up with this uh, discourse we have defended democracy in times when it needed to be defended we know what democracy is and it is us to teach Western Europe how to be democratic not for them to tell us what it means and this is also um, based um, on an assessment of the communist past, which is, um, again, an interesting one, let's see. Okay, I think I will, I will stop uh, here with this, um, uh, with this question and uh, we will come back, I think, in the discussion. Indeed, thank you so much, Simina, um, for this enlightening comments also on well, the legacy of communism in Eastern Europe, which is often forgotten, especially in Western Europe. And by going from Eastern to Western Europe and turning from Simina to Michael, I would like to mirror a little bit the question I just asked to Simina and ask Michael whether as far as the Holocaust is concerned, you would still consider it the single most important historical reference point in Western Europe, or whether you might also discern a certain qualification of that status over the last two de decades, not least in view of an ever wider time gap between the actual historical experience and our today's memory thereof, with fewer and fewer contemporary witnesses being still alive, and other more recent historical events perhaps superseding the memory of the Holocaust. How would you see uh, this development, Michael. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the question and, and thanks for the invitation. It's great to share this panel with my two other distinguished panelists as well who've already said so many interesting things. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I think your question, is the Holocaust central, can be taken in two ways as a kind of empirical historical question, is the Holocaust still a central reference point? There's also another question, should the Holocaust still be the central reference point? I'll focus primarily on the first question, is it central? But I also have some thoughts on the question of whether it should be central and perhaps we can get to those at well, as well. Um, I think at the official level, it's very clear that the Holocaust remains a, if not the central reference point for Western European self-conceptions. So we have commemorative days like January 27th, we have memorials and museums and all sorts of forms of institutionalized memory. We have films and novels and memoirs. Um, the Holocaust, as far as I know, is quite central in school curricula across much of Western Europe. So it seems to me clear in all of these different ways, the Holocaust remains quite a central reference point um, uh, for, for European publics. Now, of course, that's contested, but I think even in those contestations, the Holocaust remains the reference point against which other memories are being measured and contested. So even in the contestation, it remains quite central. Yet at the same time, I think we have to recognize that that centrality is uneven, and it's uneven in a few different ways. Um, I think there's a pretty clear divide between public and private in a lot of contexts. So there have been studies, for example, in the German context, which show that even though Germany is well known for making the Holocaust an official central part of its self-conception, that when you get to the familial level, when you get to the private sphere, 
you don't see the same kind of centrality. You don't see a transmission of Holocaust memory happening in, the, in families, quite the opposite in a lot of instances. So that's one place of unevenness, the private versus public divide. I think there, there's clearly going to be unevenness across national contexts and across regional contexts, right? It's not gonna be the same in Germany and France and the Netherlands and Belgium. You have to take those kinds of things into account as well, of course. And finally, I think you have to ask, well, if it's central, what, what are the meanings that are central? Can we assume that the meanings of that memory stay the same across these various different divides? So is the meaning of the Holocaust some sort of um, moralistic tale of victims and perpetrators? Or is there a possibility for a more complicated uh, vision, a complicated memory that brings into, uh, into the picture questions of complicity and various other kinds of complications? And maybe we can return to that later. And finally, I think we have to ask, if it's central, what is the impact of that centrality? And here's where I would connect to some of the, the points that Rura Misai made and that we can also continue to discuss as we go along. What kind of impact is this memory actually having, right? How does it speak to forms of racism that uh, persist, uh, right? Despite this very prominent memory, how, what do we make of the right-wing turn that's happened in so many countries across West and Eastern Europe in the face of this central Holocaust memory? So those are kinds of questions I think we need to address. Now, Marcus, you mentioned also this kind of time gap and asked whether there might be a kind of fading of Holocaust memory. Now, I think obviously we're in a moment of transition. I think obviously um, as the eyewitnesses, as the eyewitness generation disappears, there are going to be changes in the memory. But one thing that's been clear to me in studying Holocaust memory is that it in no way works in that kind of linear way. In other words, far from fading, Holocaust memory has actually gotten stronger over the decades, right? And so, for example, in English, the very word Holocaust, which identified this very particular singular event, only emerged in the 1960s as the term to be used to describe the Nazi genocide of European Jews. So it took a couple of decades before that kind of memory even uh, got going. And I think that serious grappling with the Holocaust in many European countries was also similarly delayed. Now, once it got going, it, it actually kind of accelerated over the years and you have these various moments, again, not in a smooth or linear way, but you have these various moments of intensification. Like the late 1970s, for example, when this sort of trashy American television miniseries Holocaust was shown in Germany and had an incredible effect. Right? And a lot of people trace that to one of the first moments when there was a kind of broad engagement with the Holocaust because of this particular TV series. Or again, 1993, there was an American news show that, that described 1993 as the year of the Holocaust. Why? It was the year that the US Holocaust Museum opened in Washington. It was the year that Schindler's List was released. It was also a year when there was increased uh, neo-Nazi activity being reported throughout Europe, that there was genocide in Yugoslavia or something like genocide in Yugoslavia. Um, so that was another one of these moments of inflection. So whatever is happening now, I think we have to realize that this history of, of Holocaust memory has never been linear. It's always developed in a more complicated way. And I think that's actually true also of the other memories that we're talking about today. In a way, Samina alluded to that in her discussion, this first period of kind of forgetting and silence, and then you start to have uh, an, an increase in interest as, as things go by. I think that's also true of slavery and colonialism. I don't think those histories have in any way received adequate attention in the European sphere or in many other spheres, but I do think there's an increase that we find today um, decades, even in some ways, centuries after uh, some of those events took place. And that kind of brings me to uh, what I call multi-directional memory, because I think what you see is the interaction of these different kinds of memories actually produces more memory. I think there's a kind of concern often expressed among, for example, people who um, are, uh, uh, want to keep the Holocaust central, that if we start to bring in other histories, the Holocaust will lose out on centrality. And there's a concern among people who think that we should have more memory of slavery and colonialism, for instance, or communism for that matter, that the, central, the centrality of the Holocaust has, has blocked those things. And what I found in my research is that's not really the way it works. That actually there's a kind of dialogical process that tends to lead 
uh, to more memory, right? So it's because the Holocaust became central that we started to talk about some of these other histories as well, that they've started to become more central. Again, not necessarily in adequate ways, but a process has begun. And what I also found, which is even more surprising, and I'll talk more about this later perhaps, is that from the very beginning, Holocaust memory was itself inflected by people who were reflecting also on slavery and colonialism. And that's, I think, the less well-known side of the story, but to me, that's a very important one. And I guess the point of my notion of multidirectional memory is that you actually can have all of these memories interacting. And that kind of comes back to the question, should the Holocaust be central? And I guess my point is that Europe doesn't necessarily need to have one center, right? That it's actually possible to have, uh, to have a kind of a more complicated cultural memory sphere in which these memories interact with each other and are seen as understood as interacting with each other. And maybe that's the most important lesson for European memory is that we don't need a single center, but we can actually have multiple centers. And that that might actually be one way of addressing some of the concerns that Rura Misai, for instance, already raised about the way that racist legacies continue despite what should ostensibly be an anti-racist Holocaust memory, which is at the center of European public life. Thank you so much. Actually, what, what I would be curious to hear from both of you is, of course, the idea of that you don't require in a European context one particular dominant um, memory framework uh, is certainly a valid one and, and, and goes um, matches also the idea, you know, the, the, the logo of the European Union, united in diversity. But don't you see also a bit of a danger when you have essentially in the European context now two totally separate uh, memory frameworks. So in other words, don't you see a certain danger in the Holocaust on the one hand, communism on the other hand, to be in a kind of European memory competition? And how can we overcome such a potential competition between the two? Because each of them seems to claim, you know, have more legitimacy. That's where the problem arises. So do you see a potential way out of that? Simina, perhaps first. Um, it's an very interesting question and uh, of course I don't have a definite answer but it's something that we um, I have been thinking about and we have been thinking about at the museum my, my feeling is is that this um, competition is nearing its end I think it has started as a competition as I explained because um, of course the memory of communism was really really very repressed and not because of, uh, of the memory of Holocaust taking all the stage, but just because of the context that I explained that it was just not the moment for East European, that it takes some time to uh, come, in, come to terms, to come into contact with traumatic memory because it's, it was all kinds of um, uh, trauma that happened in, in that time. It was a long time, very diverse and different stories. So it's, um, it's this first moment of, um, of discovery and acknowledgement which is very activist in a way so it's it's very powerful it's very it's full of force and it it triggers conflict but um what i would um also like to mention and um i was thinking as um michael was talking that it would be interesting i think to see how the memory of the Holocaust in itself or the, mem the memorialization of the Holocaust has been influenced or is starting to be influenced by all the diverse memory processes it triggered. This I don't know, but I mean, I, mean, I, I would just assume that this should happen, that it's not only uh, providing inspiration and it's not only fertilizing, but it's getting fertilized by other types of memories and commemorations. Um, and I was thinking about the, the memory of communism in this case, and I only know the, um, the East European case much better, which is that actually uh, this upsurge in, um, in the research and in acknowledgement of the memory of communism and, and victims of communism and traumas of com communism actually triggered an interest, like a genuine interest also in the memory of the Holocaust, because um, Usually when we talk about Holocaust, even here in this panel, we kind of assign it to Western Europe, which historically is wrong. I mean, of course, the memory of the Holocaust is mainly a West European uh, reality, let's say, or memory. 
but the Holocaust itself, it's not a West European phenomenon, it's mainly a East European one. So what happened in Eastern Europe when this, um, um, in post-communism is that you start uh, digging your own um, um, story on communism and then you reach the Second World War and then you, I don't know, you watch Schindler's List or things like this that seem to have happened um, in some other uh, countries or on some other land. But actually when um, the European Union asks you for a formal condemnation of the Holocaust, it's not a formal condemnation of the Holocaust that happened in Germany or uh, on a TV series. You really need to, to start uh, understanding what has happened in your country and what has your uh, national community, let's say your state in the end, did in this, um, in this horrible process, which was the Holocaust, which for Romania, it's still, uh, it's still a, a big trauma and a, a, it's reaching public acknowledgement, but very slowly. This is again, I think very interesting when talking about stages of, of memory and of acknowledgement, because in, um, in Eastern Europe, not only Romania, the memory of Holocaust is secondary to the memory of communism. It only comes second to, let's say, um, um, hierarchy of, um, of victims. But um, just to, to answer uh, your question about the, um, the competition, I, I think that if we start to um, to see um, to see a continuity and to see that it's not uh, it's not separate chunks of history that they continued each other and then um, maybe I will I will leave this for uh, for further discussions because there's a, a very also interesting and curious thing that's happening with communism and Holocaust which is about um, victims and perpetrators because it's being too periods of time that have directly followed each other. Sometimes you find uh, victims of, of one regime becoming the perpetrators in the other and the other way around. And this again makes the whole thing immensely complicated. And the first in instinct would be to say, okay, this is, this is going to be a race, this is going to be a competition, but it shouldn't be. Of course, there are ways to, to talk about this in a non-competitive and just inclusive way. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Simina. I mean, you obviously stress also the need for a more holistic approach and one that also considers more entanglements between different, not just memories, but indeed different historical experiences. And Michael before has already stressed as well that we should not only stay in the European context and stay in the context of Holocaust versus communism, but indeed go further. Um, and on that, so, and, and, an interesting question is undoubtedly whether and to which degree public memories of totalitarianisms in the plural and colonialism are also intertwined. And in, in your book on multidirectional memory, Michael, and by employing there a comparative and also interdisciplinary approach, you have demonstrated the link between Holocaust studies and memory of the Holocaust on the one hand, post-colonialism on the other. In view now of very recent developments, such as the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States or the reignited colonialism debate in a number of European countries, including Belgium. How would you assess that link today and its possible future development? Okay, thanks. I mean, I was also had a couple of thoughts about your previous question, Marcus, and maybe I can use those to lead into this answer, which, and I was going to say something. By all like means, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say something like what you just said, which is that. You know, obviously what's important is, is to get out of this binary, is to get out of this binary and realize that there are more than two histories at stake here. here. And, and again, I would go back to Rura Misai's initial comments. What we have to realize is the way that Europe was constructed precisely through its entanglements, and entanglements is kind of an overly polite word maybe for with, with non-European spaces through colonialism and slavery, right? And so what, what we know of as Europe is a product of that history as well. So we're not at all dealing with two histories here. We have to, at the very least, triangulate those histories. We have to provincialize Europe and see how Europe um, is, uh, is, has always been uh, uh, produced through these other kinds of forms of violence that are in some ways outside of Europe and yet still defining the inside of Europe. Um, 
in multi-directional memory, I was especially interested in the early post-war period. And one of the things that struck me and kind of led me into the topic was that this early period from say 1945 to 1962 was both the moment when a kind of Holocaust memory was starting to emerge, which really starts to happen after 1961, the Eichmann trial, that's the traditional narrative. Um, but that was also the classical period of decolonization, right? When so many uh, countries in Africa and elsewhere were becoming independent, you had various wars of decolonization going along as well. And it struck me that these two, these two things must have something to do with each other, that they were happening at the same time. And what I found was a surprising archives, uh, archive of works, especially by Jewish and black intellectuals, but also by people who don't fit into either of those categories, who were trying to understand the Nazi genocide precisely in relationship to the history of European colonialism and slavery. And so in the early post-war period, you have, for example, books like Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism and M. A. Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism, both of whom were theorizing what they called in more or less similar terms, a boomerang effect, whereby the violence that had been perpetrated outside of Europe in the colonies had returned to Europe in the form of Nazi violence, right? And so there, there were a number of intellectuals in those early decades right after the war who were thinking in these terms. Another uh, discovery for me was that the context of the Algerian War of Independence uh, was a particularly rich moment when again, you saw memories of the Holocaust emerging in France among kind of anti-war activists or pro-Algerian uh, pro activists, again, in relationship to what was happening in France with the creation of camps, with torture going on uh, in, the, in the Algerian War. So my first point would be, that there have always been connections between Holocaust memory, colonialism, and racism, that these go all the way back to the moment when the Holocaust started to be understood for what it is. And in fact, I have a student, Ben Ratzkoff, who's looking at black intellectuals' responses to Nazism in the 30s and during the war itself, and they're already making these connections. So before the Holocaust itself, they're already seeing links between racism and anti-Semitism, Nazi policy, colonial policy, et cetera. So this goes all the way back. Now that said, I think of course things have changed since that earlier period as well. And one of the things that cha that's changed is what I was talking about in my previous answer, which is that the Holocaust has itself become globalized, right? That we are now in a very different moment. In this early period, we didn't yet have a conception of the Holocaust as a specific and unique event. That only started to emerge in the 1960s. So there was this moment uh, when there was in some ways more openness. So now the Holocaust has been globalized. It's become a kind of model for a certain sort of morality of good and evil, for a certain kind of human rights regime as, as scholars like uh, Daniel Levy and Nathan Schneider have argued. I don't think that's a bad thing, but it changes the picture in a certain sense. Um, now that the Holocaust has, has become this kind of reference point. And I guess to, to echo a little bit what I said earlier, I think there's a need right now to decenter the Holocaust, I would say, right? Which doesn't mean to relativize it. It certainly doesn't mean to take it out of the, the, the public sphere. I think that commemoration of the Holocaust remains essential in Europe and elsewhere. Um, but again, I don't think it needs to be the only uh, history occupying that kind of central position. I think we, we can recognize that there are other histories that should be put alongside it that are also important to what, Euro what Europe is and can perhaps help us to conceive even more complicated uh, versions of human rights or, or morality. So what I would say is that Europe needs a more diverse and a less monolithic memory culture. And I'm actually excited about the work that activists are doing, grassroots activists are doing uh, right now to make that possible with street renamings, um, with all sorts of commemorations that, that we're seeing, um, particularly this year, but this has been going on for some time. Thanks a lot, Michael, for, for your intervention. What I would be curious to hear maybe from Rura Misai is to dwell a little bit more on colonialism as a slightly neglected part of, of European, Europeans' historical memory. Um, while we are here focusing mainly on European historical memories, slavery and colonialism in particular have a distinctively non-European, let's call it like this dimension. And so how would you assess the status of this heritage, 
uh, and memory outside Europe and the critical dealing with this legacy, in particular in, in Africa, in comparison to Europe, Ruramisai. Could you give us some thoughts on that? Also, to, to get away a little bit from this very monolithic understanding of memory in Europe that is present. Thank you. And uh, how do you say, Michael and Semina had me write notes, so I hope I will sort of remember to, to capture it all. I think I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier on, the ways in which the idea of Europe itself also happens outside of Africa, I mean, outside of Europe, right? To say, um, you know, somebody said, no, Europe happened on the way to Santiago de Compostela. You know, people went there and over time, the idea of Europe came together. Probably that's, that's one version. So one might say, to go back to the multi-directional idea there. The other one is that Europeans, at least the ones that we think of now, nowadays as sort of the racists, if you will, come out of Europe as Europeans, but even then probably not so much as Europeans, but as particular people from particular places, as I, I, as I mentioned earlier on. So say in the idea of slavery, right? It's in the colonies, it's someplace else. What comes back is just the sugar and the coffee and the cotton. How it was obtained, in some ways, it goes back to the idea of innocence, right? I can consume the coffee, I can consume the sugar. How it was made, I don't care. And it also moves on to the idea that some of those people, especially Africans, are then brought to Europe as creatures to watch you know, spectacles, if you, if you wish, you know, put in zoos and so on. And in Brussels, there you have the infamous examples of King Leopold bringing people from uh, the Congo, right? So that in some ways, the idea of Europe, at least in relation to Africa as well, is built on the idea of negation of African people as human beings, right? Or people of African descent as uh, uh, human beings. And much of it happens away from the site of the crime, right? So that in some ways, to go back to the uh, uh, issue that Michael was talking about, the centrality of the Holocaust. And one of my arguments is part of the fact that the crime happened, like there was a crime scene, right? In the sense of Eastern and Western Europe, you have all these death camps, like absolutely horrendous. So that in some ways, you know that the person who denies that they didn't know, of course knew. How can you not know something that is happening in your backyard? Whereas with colonialism, it's happening someplace else. And the Africans and the natives are not recording what you're doing. And the recording depends on the same people. So that even the whole discussion about the colonial archive also speaks to this idea that even when you write African history of the last 500 years, you're depending on the Spanish records, on the Portuguese records, on so and so. So by and large, even the, the discipline of history itself becomes indicted because in many ways you are asking the perpetrator to say, you know, sort of in some, in some ways the hunter and the hunted, you're asking the hunter to tell both versions of the story in many ways because, but of course you might say social history and cultural history have tried to change that to have a conversation. But by and large, because this thing happened outside of Europe, there's this sense of inherited innocence in some ways that most Europeans find it very difficult to, to, you know, they always have a counter argument about why, you know, the Africans now they've been free for so long, why don't we just forget about colonialism? It's your fault now. And you might say, you know, Africans should be able to run their own countries. But if you look at the history of how those countries became countries in and of themselves, and that's part of what I did with my first book, to look at the ways in which even the idea of the nation itself, how the Africans in many ways have to sort of burn almost everything that they have, even though the nationalist movement sort of picks and chooses what it wants from the idea of the nation itself. By and large, it's also modeling itself on what Europe is. But at the same time, Europe itself, even the European countries that make the, the EU say, the vast majority of them, especially the quote unquote big ones, in many ways become France and become Germany and become the Netherlands and become all of this in the ways that we think about them at the same time, right? So in the 19th century, when most European countries become sort of countries instead of kingdoms and so on, in many ways, the Africans themselves are sort of 
trying to reimagine who they are. And then in the mix, colonialism comes and sort of does what it does. So that in the process, both could have become something else, but because you have this violent imposition of ideas of what it is to be a nation, by and large, most of the Africans, especially the first uh, generation of leaders, in many ways, even though they were nationalist and anti-colonialist, many of them had really imbibed the violence of colonialism, right? So that in some ways you sort of have this long shadow on the thing. And this is not to take away the agency of the people who are running these things, you know, they could have chosen differently as some did. All to say also that part of why the conversation becomes difficult and also in some ways complicated is the ways in which slavery and colonialism happen outside of Europe. So that the conversation about it sort of invites this idea that, you know, it wasn't our fault. You know, after all, you sold your cousins. After all, you signed the paper that say, take my country. So that in some ways, when it comes to memory of, Af of colonialism and slavery in particular, there's a sense of relativism, right? So that in some ways, there's that idea that you can always bend the rules. And some of it also has to do, I think, and I'll go back to the same idea again, the idea that Africans as a people are not people, right? So that the idea even that somebody has to say Black Lives Matter, that in and of itself is a statement that says something about the idea that somebody has to insist that Black Lives Matter, right? So that for me, it speaks to the history of colonialism. It speaks especially to the history of slavery as well, that by making Blackness itself the sort of antithesis the thing that everybody wants to get away from, it really makes it so that becoming European or like Europe, even in economic development, it sort of lifts you up, right? So that you become the model country that can develop, but look at Africa there. And even the African countries, the ones that slightly do better tend to then think of themselves as, you know, sort of not of Africa, if you will. So then in some ways, the only way you can redeem your blackness is sort of somehow becoming like Europe. And I think that that's a, a, an issue that we need to have a conversation about. And in many ways, and I will just quickly uh, highlight this that Michael spoke to as well, which speaks to the idea of the sort of say the, the power or the impact of uh, the Holocaust memory in African uh, history and colonialism in particular. And if you look at say Southern Africa in particular, the anti-apartheid movement, for example, both in South Africa and in what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, disproportionately, the white people who were in, that, in those movements, the anti-apartheid movements were almost always Jews. So that in some ways, there's sort of the history of being a part of a minority somewhere that comes into the consciousness and plays into that. So that the majority of white people always had this idea that, oh, Jew, so that they see Jews as these people who interrupt whiteness, if you will, sort of in some ways, instead of having this really nice package whiteness, you always have the Jew who comes in and sort of spoils it, so to, so to speak. So that in some ways then it brought in a conversation of what is the meaning of colonialism and also that within anti-colonial and later on post-colonial societies as well, say Namibia, for example, looking at the Holocaust uh, memory and reparations as well, and using that as an example of, you know, how come you were able to do this to these other people? What about us, right? So that it then becomes a conversation of color because then race is an issue that is, well, if you think of the history of Jews as a race in Europe and being treated thus, and then you have Africans who are always quote unquote race, but then you think to yourself, here are two different people who theoretically should be black and white, but all both in very different ways have had this interaction with people who think of themselves as European and have treated these people as different based on their quote unquote race as well. So that it becomes very important to sort of see the connections, I think, and that's why it's, for me it's important. And also as a cultural historian, I see that as important because it's really in the cultures of memory that happen that we actually can bring this uh, to a close. And last but not least, I would say that communism also becomes very important because for anti-colonial movements, they were fighting the West, right? So they went to the East and learned something so that in some ways, even in the remembering this, you know, in this case, I would say the polite term entanglement would work 
you know, because with slavery and colonialism, I don't think that's entanglement. I think that's just basic violence there. <laughs> but in the post, in the communist part, you actually see the ways in which, you know, because the West wants Africans to remain or the, the colonized to remain colonized, basically they have to become sort of pawns of the Cold War, right? And then when communism falls apart, it sort of brings in a different dynamic as well, because now in Eastern Europe with the migration uh, crisis, quote unquote, you sort of see the ways in which some Africans thought that, you know, the Eastern European countries would actually remember, you know, that we were once comrades, but that memory is sort of kind of very complicated. And I think I would like to hear more from Semina how that also works, because it also plays to the idea of Europeanness and also whiteness itself, right? Because in many ways, it's also there's the idea of the West and whiteness, but there's also the idea of how Eastern Europe becomes white also over time as well. So I'll leave it at that and, you know, sort of join in later on. Thank you so much, Ruramizai. Simina, would you like to comment maybe um, on that? Maybe just very briefly, um... I would say that as far as I know, this anti-colonial uh, movement in the socialist countries was, was very, very political and very high level. So it was never really a real uh, social movement. It was coming so much from top down that it never really reached people. And this is maybe um, an interesting uh, point to take over to, to our discussions in general about commemoration and about policies that are made for memory and for um, it's always very tricky the level to which you can actually influence you can actually educate and penetrate people if you just do it um, as a sort of um, um, in this sort of just policy and politics and everything but um, actually I wanted to uh, just to add something to what um, Rura Misai was saying. Uh, for me, whenever I, um, I read this um, commemoration and discussions about slavery and about colonialism and everything, which I also think are very, very important and obviously under discussed, I'm, um, I'm always wondering um, if slavery that, had ha that has happened inside Europe is also brought in this discussion. And I, I'm uh, referring obviously to Roma slavery, which is something that it's, um, it's real and it has happened in, at least in the Romanian principalities for 500 years. So it's something very strong. It happened in, as you said, in their back, as you said about slavery, that it was not in their backyard, in Europeans backyard. So it's easy for them to say they didn't know. So for, um, for the, the the region of the Romanian principalities, it was really in their backyard. So, like the Orthodox Church was the biggest slave owner in um, up until the 19th century, middle 19th century. It was abolished about the same time when it was abolished in the United States. And this is, if we are talking about, I don't know, degrees or steps or uh, of memory in in Eastern Europe, then this is really very very um, unacknowledged. It's just it's. It's, it almost doesn't exist. And of course, this is superimposed on, on a very, very deep and violent racism towards Roma in, in Eastern Europe in general, in Europe in general. It's just to add a bit to the difficulty of the questions. Thanks too. I mean, I think what has become clear um, also uh, from the from the last comments but throughout the debate is this intrinsic link between memory and the political side or even politics on on the other and perhaps before turning to the questions from our audience it would be great if you could still uh, take up a few of those as well um, i would like to briefly discuss with you that link so the relationship between collective memory on the one hand and politics on the other and maybe ask all three of you um, in view of a development that could be described as a revival of politics of history, that is history and it's remember it's becoming politicized for concrete purposes and the matter of ideological and partisan contestation. Um, if we assume that 
this is really a development you see that would be already part of the question. Do you see that as well, a return of politics of history or perhaps it was never different. So it's not a return, it's just an always the same. But which role would you ascribe to the political realm when it comes to public memory, if any? In other words, is history too important and too sensitive to be left to politicians and other non-specialists? Or the other uh, side of the coin, is history too important to be left to historians and scholars alone? Michael, perhaps. Just one note, there's some construction going on in the building that I'm in right now. I don't know if you can hear that. I hope it's not too loud, but I will try to uh, try to go on. But let me know if it's if it becomes annoying and maybe we could we could wait a moment. Um, I would say as a scholar of Holocaust memory that I would not say that what we're experiencing today is any kind of major shift in the politicization of history and memory. Um, in other words, memory of the Holocaust has always been political. It's always been politicized. That, take, that has taken place at the local level, um, at the national level, and in the international sphere. And just to join into the discussion that started a moment ago about, uh, which I think is really interesting and important between communism and anti-colonialism, Another thing that I found in kind of investigating this, what I call this multi-directional archive of connections between the Holocaust and colonialism and slavery is many of the people participating in that were communists, or at least at, at some point were communists. So it may be true, as Samina says, that in Eastern Europe, this was a very high level phenomena that didn't really filter down. But I think for a lot of people, especially from the colonial world, it was actually still a very powerful link. And so you have people like Césaire, who was a, was a Communist Party member when he wrote the discourse on colonialism. He later broke with it. W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American intellectual and activist, uh, fellow traveler of communism, made fascinating and I think really nuanced links between uh, racism against Black people and, and anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Also close association with communism. So there's that whole dimension there. Um, but thinking back uh, on, how, on, on the way that, that this memory has always been politicized, one of the things I think of is the debates about reparations in the early 1950s. Today, reparations are taken for the Holocaust are taken as a kind of model, I think rightly so, for things like slavery and colonialism. But in the early 1950s, when Germany and uh, Israel were negotiating the uh, that question of reparations, there were riots in Israel by people opposed to reparations, right? Who were saying, you can't put a price on the life of my relatives, on the, on the life of my ancestors. So that was a very political discussion that was taking place in the early 50s. Or think of the 1980s in Germany, the historical strike, right? This debate very relevant to our conversation today about the relative uh, significance of the Holocaust on the one hand, of Stalinism on the other hand. Or in France, ongoing debates about Vichy, about the resistance, all of this kind of stuff has always been political and it's always been politicized. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually what gives a kind of vitality um, to, to collective memory, to cultural memory. I think if anything has changed today, it's the fact that we're seeing new agents of memory. And again, that's what I think is exciting that's going on. You have, again, the Black Lives Matter movement, or in Germany, the Initiative for Black Germans is playing a really crucial role in bringing out some of these sorts of colonial histories and trying to really insert them into the fabric of the city and the fabric of the nation. Another project that I've been working on uh, with Yasemin Yildiz, who's a scholar of migration, is, is about migrant in engagement with Holocaust memory. And we're looking at Germany and especially interested in the way that Turkish German migrants and post-migrants have negotiated this very prominent uh, German memory culture. And one of the things we found is that there's really original and exciting, and I would say very multi-directional work going on um, produced by agents of memory, cultural producers, who you might not expect to be part of this conversation about Holocaust memory, right? Who have a Muslim background or a migration background, who may have no familial or personal link to these events, or who might, right, in unexpected ways. And so I guess to me, that's one of the, the differences today in terms of this question of the politics of memory is who gets to speak, who gets to remember, whose memories are taken seriously. And that's where I think a lot of the action is. It's not, is it political or not? It's who gets to participate in this discussion that I think is important. And in this context, Michael, would you still see an active role for politicians? Or would you rather argue for politicians not to take an active role? Yeah, I mean, I guess when I was thinking about your question initially, I was thinking, 
of course, scholars are important in this discussion. Of course, politicians are, are, are involved, are important in this discussion, but we also have to go beyond those categories. And again, bring in these kinds of grassroots a, roots activists and cultural producers that I was thinking of. But yeah, I think politicians remain of course important and set a kind of tone, right? So I'm thinking of, of Merkel, for example, and the so-called refugee crisis of 2015, who played a very important, very positive, prominent role in, uh, in impact, and this isn't strictly about memory here, though I think questions of memory of the Holocaust and also of uh, the expellees in Germany was important in this que refugee question. So memory was certainly there, but just as an example of the way a politician can set a tone. And we have a lot of negative examples of that too. Simina, I think earlier mentioned the cases of Poland and Hungary, where politicians are playing an important politicizing role. I would say it's a very bad one. Um, but it's not because they're politicians speaking out of the, about these things that we have a problem. It's the kinds of things they're saying. It's the kind of agenda that they're producing. So yes, I think politicians remain uh, also central to this issue. Thank you very much, Michael. Rura Misai, would you share Michael's feelings about how political memory is and always has been and the role of politicians? Or would you see it perhaps differently from him? I, 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 I would agree with Michael on that and extend it. And also as a cultural historian, for me, again, the quotidian is important in the everyday so that politics is about power, right? So that the idea also is about the power structures that are there. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my uh, first remarks, the ways in which at least for the last 500 years, give or take, not in a sort of a straight hammer way, but sort of slowly, slowly sort of creeping imperialism on everything. By and large, we've been working around sort of a European idea of itself that it's kind of seeded around the world, right? Violence included. So that if you think of democracy even, at least in relation to Africa and people of African descent all over the world, there's this idea also that, you know, Europeans, you know, uh, are sort of democratic and, you know, Yes, there was the one blip with the Holocaust, but you know, but also if you think of Jewish history in, in Europe itself, I remember when I read, I forget the name of the, the author, Michael, you might help me on this one. The book Zakor, uh, remember? Yerushalmi, Yerushalmi. Yes, yes. And the ways in which for me, it was really like the first time I read it, it was very revelatory in, sort of, in some sort of showing the history of Jews in Europe and the ways in which just about every country, because by and large, when you think of the Holocaust, it's like, you know, you have this one country that this, this did these terrible things and somehow every other country is absorbed, but by bringing all that history together, it actually allows you to sort of see, ah, okay, even the democracy in that way, you have had many minority groups or sort of excluded groups, but you also have had the democracy has come because other people who were oppressed within Europe itself have been able to sort of push back on that. And I think also that goes to, to what Samina also mentioned earlier on with the, the Roma and slavery in Europe as well. And say in the Americas, right? You have Haiti, right? Everybody, you say Haiti and people think of, oh, that poor country. But people forget that it's one of, it's if not the country that brought the idea of democracy, right? Enslaved people saying to hell with this and sort of staging a successful revolution to actually change things. And then the process of politics in many ways to try and forget that revolution in some ways and to demonize you know, the idea that black people as human beings also want to be free and have the idea of what democracy means, give or take what the leader of the revolution uh, himself stood for. And also in the United States, uh, I don't know if any, you know, anyone has read uh, Isabel Wilkerson's uh, The Warmth of Other Suns. It's an excellent, excellent book. In many ways also showing the ways in which even the United States and this idea of you know, everybody created equal by and large is because the Native Americans and the African Americans in particular having had to fight like every inch of freedom you have and every idea that you're a free country and a democratic country has really been around the politics of power and therefore the politics of remembrance, right? And if you think of the Museum of American History, for example, who has been excluded from that and even the monuments that have been around the country, who has been memorialized 
And of course, the irony is always that everybody is taxed, right? Everybody is taxed to build these monuments, even if you get some funds from the private people. But by and large, the, 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 the politicians allow for these spaces to be taken over. So that in some ways, also the politics of power and the politics of memory are really sort of very much intertwined. And I think also it's very important to look at the ideas and the ideas that Europe sort of holds up as distinguishing itself from other people, especially say the Africans and the former colonized people, and to sort of look at what's the history of that and what does it tell us? And if we leave it only to the politicians, they will do good by signing a piece of paper, but every day I have to step in a bus as a black person and have to always think like, no, I need to buy a car because I can't be in the bus and go through this every time. Like I don't deserve this, right? So that in some ways then for me, the everyday is very important because if the everyday is engaged with, then we can change life. I mean, look at everybody has a smartphone now and that's the everyday, right? Every day, but the politics of power of who controls those you know, apps and all that is another conversation. The idea being that if we can bring these kinds of conversations to the everyday that people have a critical reflection of the self, not just waiting for the president to say something or the somebody else to say something, but to also see one as an agent of change and an agent of history and to actually get involved. So that in some ways, it's also about opening up the academy as well so that the academy doesn't become uh, how would you say, a rubber stamp for the politicians. You know, you just call in a professor of something or other to something and say, professor, tell me about this, that. And the professor says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, finished. So we talk, no. For me, it's also that, but also the everyday, because that's the only way we can say, and in that way, you might say the activists are really have their pulse on the finger, because by going on the in the streets, in everyday chanting Black Lives Matter, and you can sort of go back all the way and see the ways in which ordinary people in many ways have always pushed the boundaries of what is possible for equality, for human dignity, for human rights as well. And I think that, you know, that, that in, in terms of the three, the, the colonialism, slavery, Holocaust and communism, we also see that the people uh, also become very important towards pushing politicians. And of course, if you have a really, sort of visionary politician, it can make a difference. Okay, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks a lot, Rura Misai. I mean, after, after your strong player for everyday activism um, in the fields we are talking about, maybe what is your take, Simina, on the link between memory and politics and the politicization of memory? I, I, I will try not to be very long because it's it's already getting late. Um, I think that this I mean this this link exists since um, maybe not since forever, but since enough time that it has become an integral part of European history, at least which I know the best. I think almost um, if we think about 19th and 20th century history, it's almost impossible to understand it. European history, if you don't understand how certain events memory has been used and instrumentalized politically. This is why, so I don't, um, I will not have an opinion on that if it's good or bad, because it's just something that it is. And this is why uh, at the House of European History, for example, we have included memory as um, a subject, it's as something we exhibit. So we really want our visitors to understand that for certain events, uh, sometimes the afterlife has also an equal import, has an, a very big importance, like the Holocaust, for example. So we have a section that's called the memory of the Shoah in which we, uh, we show, for example, um, six countries, uh, six European countries at a certain moment and how different it was, um, how differently the memory of the Holocaust was um, experienced. Uh, we have a whole section in the introductory section of the museum, which really looks at memory from private to political to uh, repressed to uh, just to to explain a bit how how diverse um, how different types of memory are and how um, how embedded it is in in European history. And we end with a section that's called uh, shared and divided memory, where we really look at this uh, communist Holocaust memory and how. Um, they um, they influenced each other and how 
Um, but I, I think we are one of the first, if not the first, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware actually of any other history museum that really looks at, at that it's not only um, exhibiting or reflecting the, it's not a memory activist, but it's really looking at memory as its subject. And also, of course, educating in the meantime, uh, its visitors to understand how, how fragile and potentially dangerous while also potentially healing memory can be, and of course, especially memory of traumatic events. Thank you so much, Simina. And with that, perhaps, let us turn to, to the last part of our today's debate. I'm for sure we could continue for much longer, but it would be great also to address some of the questions which our uh, audience um, have raised and given the time constraints it will is unlikely that we will be able to take up all the pertinent questions we have received during our debate now from the online audience and i can only ask for everybody's understanding but uh, we will make an effort to address at least a few of those questions that my colleague blandin smilanski has kindly pre-selected um, and i would ask you as speakers perhaps to be as short as possible uh, in your replies and i will leave it up to you to reply if you feel like replying obviously no one is forced to reply and it's not necessary that everyone replies to all questions so actually the first question we have received is from Estibalitz Esquerra Vegas and apologies for the mispronunciation that certainly has happened with regard to to your name the question goes as follows shouldn't the concept of European be challenged the amnesia Dr. Karumbira was referring to it's structural, yet some Europeans do remember those who are not acknowledged as such black individual. How would you comment on that? Yes, please, Rurabi Zai. I would say it's it's very true i guess it's pretty much like one might say every because the idea even of nations themselves and how people identify you know are sort of constructed and as far as europe you know sort of the idea that europe has sort of seeped itself into every place i think is sort of worth considering people might choose to keep the name europe but i think the it's almost like we're at a point where we need the sort of root trunk and crown sort of structural adjustment of the idea rather than because in many ways trimming a branch here and trimming a branch there we really won't change anything because it's been going on for 500 years differently but i think it's it's i would agree that it's something that's worth engaging with because by engaging it then it actually brings out of the shadows the idea mm -hmm. of or the histories because as long as we're just saying you know, like Europe is not opened up itself, then it's 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 easy to just sort of have conversations without actually dealing with this sort of systemic and the root of all the cause, the cause of all that we have today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you, Michael or Simina, like to add something or should we turn to the second question? No, Simina, Michael? Say hi, Esti, a former student of mine, in fact, and it really, I think, a really great uh, question. And I, and I don't think I have a very good answer to it. I guess I still will admit that I believe enough in the European project as having some potential liberatory value that I, I'm not sure I want it, would want to necessarily do away with it entirely. And I think part of what we're seeing is struggles of people to be included in it and to transform it. And I think those are valuable. At the same time, we need to deconstruct it, open it up to a more uh, global transnational uh, realm as well. So I think we need to do different things at the same time. But I guess I wouldn't necessarily give up on the idea uh, entirely, but would wanna see how far we can push it, how far we can transform it. And I, though I agree with uh, Ruru Misai, it has to be a really, down to the roots, it has to be structural transformation. And that involves the relation of Europe to the rest of the world, obviously. Um, but I think we can, we can work on different levels, I suppose. Thank you for that, Michael. Actually, the next question is also a very pertinent one by Katarina Stolipina, I guess mainly addressed to you, Michael, but of course, everyone is free to come in. 
And the question reads as follows, why the notion Holocaust is used to describe the genocide of Jews, but not other people or nations or citizens of other countries? That's a really interesting question. And I was thinking about uh, something related to this as we were talking. I mean, I'll say upfront, obviously Holocaust is a problematic word by itself. I mean, a lot of scholars of what we call the Holocaust have said this as well. It implies, I mean, it comes from the Greek for burnt offering, right? And there's a kind of implicit uh, message there that somehow this was a sacrifice, right? That the killing of Jews was a sacrifice for some greater good. Obviously that's absurd. Now, I don't think most people think of that when they think of the word Holocaust. And we just use it because it's become, it's become uh, at least in English and, and also in other languages, uh, the, 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 the most used uh, term for the events. I try to shift a little bit myself when I write between Nazi genocide, Shoah, et cetera. But that's not quite what you're getting at in the question, I realize. I guess what I would say is, I, I think it's entirely appropriate to have a singular term to refer to the genocide of Jews, right? I think that there was a particularity, obviously, mm -hmm. to that genocide and that the Jews occupied a particular place in Nazi ideology and Nazi policy, right? That said, Jews were by no means the only victims of the Nazis and, no, and the genocide of Jews was by no means the only genocide that took place during the war. And so we've been talking a little bit about the Roma and I think that's really important. I'm glad that Samina brought that, that in because the Roma and Sinti were also victims of Nazi genocide. And so I guess it's a, it's a complicated negotiation here. I think we need to be able to talk about these things together, but I, I guess I'm not in principle against the idea that different events have specific names, mm -hmm. right? And that that allows that, that those are important for, uh, for memory, for collective memory. So there's a, again, a kind of negotiation between specificity and a kind of universalism or general, generality, which I think is important. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that one of the, you know, one of, that among the histories that deserve more attention are the histories of other victims of, of the Nazis. And I think we can start to bring those into the picture again without relativizing or minimizing the scale and scope of the genocide of, of European Jews. Thank you for that. Simina and Rura Misai, would you have something to add to that? No. In that case, I would say we turn to a, a, another question and one which goes actually in a slightly different direction than what Michael was arguing before in our debate from Mr. Serodes, who asks, what do you think of a need for re-Europeanization of memories? The process of memorialization has been Americanized since World War II, deprived, however, of any heroism that still boosts American narratives. How would you comment on that? Maybe to all three of you. So the question whether rather than provincializing uh, European memories, whether we might rather need a re-Europeanization to find a European way of dealing with memory because there was too much of American influence in it. Does anyone feel like well, I guess my, my, my question would be like, who were the Americans, right? Because mm -hmm. part of also when we say American, sometimes we forget that we mean European Americans, right? Predominantly, because they are also the majority, mm -hmm. uh, at least were um, the majority people and the, the power structures built around that. So that in some ways, for me, I would still go with the idea of provincializing Europe, but mm -hmm. also really like asking what does that mean? Because even within Europe, and I think even within the EU, right? I'm sure there's contestation and Samina could speak to this as well. The contestation of what does it mean to be European, right? Mm -hmm. So that four or 500 years ago, Southern Europe was the center of everything. You know, you needed to go to Italy, you needed to go to Spain or Portugal for this, that and the other thing. And they were the first ones to go across the seas in some ways. And then now, four or 500 years later, you know, power has shifted and it's now more to the north and to the northwest of the, uh, of the continent. So that for me, it's also about how do you re-engage the idea of Europe? So that even if it's the Americans, what does it look like? Does it look like 
you know, the one of our fathers that we remember, or is it a memory that includes everybody that we've been talking about here that, you know, so that if re-Europeanizing European memory includes this kind of uh, remembering the violences and, and the amnesia and all this and sort of bringing it all, then it's a much richer and more complex, complex and nuanced history rather than the sort of, you know, my father was a great hero and wasn't that really nice, you know, so that in some ways it's about, if it's about complexity and nuance, I think that that, that, that will be a really uh, rich way to engage with that. I don't know what the others think. I mean, I would say, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with what Rurimi Sai just said. I think that's important. I mean, there's no doubt that that a certain Americanized version of the Holocaust has played an outsized role in mm -hmm. Europe and around the world in creating a certain image, a certain language, a certain vocabulary, um, certain structures of memory. So that's simply true. Now, if we wanna then in opposition to that, and that has both had good elements, I think in some ways, but also clearly very problematic ones and the kind of homogenizing that's taken place. Um, if we wanna re-Europeanize, I agree with Rurimi Sai that it's gonna to have to be a new and different kind of decolonized Europe. That we want to uh, mm -hmm. that we want to create. So I I agree with the thrust of the question in that I think questioning and deconstructing the American version of this cultural memory is important. I wouldn't want to simply um, replace that with an idealized Europe. It has to precisely be the Europe that brings in the complexities and the violence, not just in the colonies but also the East-West questions that Samina has uh, raised for us as well. Mm -hmm. Simina, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I would always um, would also add a little something for me. That I was really thinking about this question because re-Europeanization for me, at first, I, it doesn't mean anything. And then I think it doesn't mean anything because also for me, Europe is like a melting pot. And what makes us Europeans is also taking uh, ideas and sometimes good ideas, sometimes bad ideas, sometimes uh, stealing uh, ideas or stealing from other. So, but it's it's not there is not such thing as something that is European or if it's not this melting of ideas. So if in the last um, half a century we have taken the let's say American model of memorializing, this is something that happened. I I don't think we should do something about it. This is. This is more organic, and it's. I mean, it's. It has already become a part of European history. This uh, American model, and yes, we are struggling with what what comes next. I don't know. A communist memory came next. This was, say, one of the big clashes. Now, um, colonial memory. It's um, it's adding up. So we will see. But it's not. I would not see it in these terms of re-Europeanization or not like that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Actually, the next question I would like to present to you by Stephanie Zicchi reminds us of the fact that also the three main memories we have talked today um, about are merely reflecting a part of the many memories in Europe. And her question is, is World War I still part of the memory in Europe? And are there perhaps differences in Eastern Europe? Simina, perhaps. Could you? Well, if I can just, yeah, maybe begin and on. answer very shortly. It all, it also depends on um, on the country. Like for, for example, for Hungary, the first world uh, first world war is still very important because that's uh, that's their national tragedy. This is when they lost uh, more than half of their territory and population, their uh, imperial uh, state, in a way. So it's uh, Trianon. It's still a um, it's still a tragedy there. So yes, mm -hmm. it's very very present. Um, and I guess for other um, yeah for other states also. I think it's more it's a maybe a bit more important in Eastern Europe because that after that the, the national states were created. So it's really I mean when um, in two thousand eighteen there was really a succession of uh, states like uh, um, uh, I miss the word now like really many many states celebrating their centenary like you could see it everywhere in um, so almost all um, 
all East European countries had had their centenaries a few years ago. So yes, it's important in that way, but I, I would have to think about other. Mm -hmm. And maybe Michael okay. and Rura Misai, would you also see maybe on a more general level, a certain neglect for the first world war, maybe even more than for colonialism in the European context, or you don't, wouldn't see that as, as really an issue? I don't know if I could make a really relative estimation. I'm a little bit outside my expertise here, but I, I would agree with Samina that certainly the centenaries from 14 to 18 mm. brought the world, First World War back in a way um, that we hadn't really seen recently or that I hadn't really seen recently. But I, don't, I still don't think it ever attained the kind of level that we have for the Second World War and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I sort of doubt though, as I argued earlier, memory is nonlinear, I, I don't really anticipate that that's going to happen, though there is one really interesting thing that's happening right now, which is that we're starting to recover this real amnesia, which is the amnesia of the so-called Spanish flu, mm -hmm. right, which is linked to the First World War. And so that is a really an interesting story, which I think there's going to be a lot of work on, at mm -hmm. least on the part of scholars, and probably forms of memorialization are going to emerge as well. And that's a really incredible forgotten episode in European and global history which now is, has, of course, is back on the agenda. And so I think, you know, it's, again, these shifts are unpredictable, right? Whoever thought we'd be talking about the Spanish flu in 2020, and yet we are. And I think we're gonna to continue to for some years to come. So again, these are nonlinear processes. And, and so it's really hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rura Misai. Well, I would just add a little bit to say that um, World War I memories in Europe is also important for Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. in particular, and also the ways in which these, you know, sort of three major strands of memory that we've been talking about become sort of very important. And in many ways with Pan-Africanism sort of taken off, that's where also you see the sort of particularity of nationalism as well, which in many ways kind of peaks by the time it gets to Second World War. So, you, you know, World War I is also important because in many ways also Africans, Asians, and other non-Europeans fought in the World War I. And people used to ask is like, how world is this? You know, since we are colonized and we're just sort of been conscripted into this. So there was this idea of, mm. you know, what's so world war about it? Isn't it a European war anyway? And the rest of us have just been conscripted. Even the <laughs> idea or naming it World mm. War I and World War II itself became part of the discourse in, in Pan-Africanist circles because the question was, is this a European war that has been branded world war and somehow everybody else has been included. But by second world war also, you sort of see the ways in which the space itself, the conscription of Africans and Asians also opens ways in which the, the, the nationalist movements can then push. And of course, women become very important in this. And I know that we haven't talked much about women, the importance of women mm. also that even pushing when it's anti-colonialism, you also always have women who are sort of saying, what about us and what about everybody else? So that, you know, women become also very important when they bring up the gender question and the gender and sexuality question into all these things. Mm. I just wanted to say World War One is also very important for, mm. for decolonization as well. Thank you. How would you perhaps uh, respond to the following question by Radostina Sharenkova? Could the concept and approaches of decolonization of heritage institutions be related to the process of dealing with communist legacies and thus contribute to integrating of European memory? So the link between decolonization of heritage institutions in particular and dealing with communist legacies. Would anyone feel like being in a position to reply? I'm again looking at Simina, but obviously also Rura Mizai. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I have uh, have not thought about the the link. Um, I know quite well what happened to uh, to inst institutions. So this decommunization, so this af aftermath of communism, what happened in Eastern Europe, but it was um, it was something close to plunder so a lot, a lot of things were this i don't i'm really thinking out loud now because i don't i don't really see the similarities so it was um communism was very very quickly put in the basement mm -hmm. so it, i don't think it was a real decommunization which would mean okay let's see 
what we have here. So if we talk about heritage institutions, so museums, for example, which had like real collections, or so they actually, I'm really talking about objects, artifacts, they were just either destroyed or um, taken to some basements, uh, stripped of their status of collection artifacts. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they were not destroyed on the spot, um, maybe afterwards, and then some who were in, in between, so it was not very clear, easy to decide if that's a communist object or not, so if it should be uh, either destroyed or hidden, or maybe that those were kept in some mm -hmm. sort of, but I am... Um, I, I think what I see now um, as the process of decolonization, I actually see as a process where you actually engage with this um, troubling artifacts and troubling histories. And um, it's, it's happening also in, um, in Eastern Europe more recently, mm -hmm. but it's not, there's not much left to, to engage with. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I would think some more about that, maybe I am. Um... Thank you, Simina. Maybe Rura Misai. I actually don't have much to say on that, on that particular score, other mm. than to say after most uh, African countries, so there was sort of waves of uh, decolonization in Africa, 1959 with Ghana and Sudan, and then 1960, you know, the 19, early 19, 1960 and early 1960s, you've quite a number of African countries who uh, got decolonized, but at the same time, mm -hmm. the Cold War is also, you might say, you know, sort of just heating up and getting hotter at that point. So that in some ways, you sort of see the play of uh, Eastern or communism, uh, more particularly, you know, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe becoming very influential, so that in some ways, one, one also sees the ways in which African memories get sort of meshed up with global memory, if you will, so that mm -hmm. the influence of these other countries, so for example, if you go to say Zimbabwe and Namibia, and uh, some other countries, you would see um, sort of heroes monuments, sort of ideas borrowed from China, Korea, North Korea, and, uh, and uh, communist Europe and the Soviet Union and the statuary mm -hmm. that's, that's there. And less more the memory that the nationalists who usually would talk about, you know, our ancestors and the founders of the nation and so on, so that the nationalists themselves become kind of, uh, kind of founders. So in terms of heritage, many of these uh, heritage systems in Africa, and you might say even in the diaspora, they were really sort of white controlled and it only took up until I would say after the fall of the Berlin Wall of the wall that you sort of have this change and in some ways there's now sort of a muted memory of once upon a time being friends with Eastern Europe or, or Soviet Union if you will so that now it's more something that you find in documentaries than active memory among people. I don't know whether this is really answering the question I sort of feel like I didn't quite get what the question wanted so I hope that's helpful. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rura Mizai. Not sure whether Michael would like to, to come in on this particular point um, any further. In any case, because having a look at the time, I'm afraid that we have to stop here also with the questions um, from the audience. So apologies again for not having been able to address all the many questions that have been um, put forward. But I think what our today's debate has demonstrated in any case is that historical memories is anything but an easy topic. It's a very complex one with a lot of entanglements, um, unresolved issues, but also one which allows really for very vibrant uh, discussions and debates. And with, with that, I would like to ask um, again, our speakers, whether they would like to add something, a final few words from each of them on today's debate and the issue of how European memories interact more generally, which was the topic of our today's debate. And perhaps starting with uh, Simina, then Rura Misai and uh, Michael will, will conclude. So Simina, please. Well, I I would just like as a conclusion to invite everyone to the House of European History, which is in Brussels, uh, to invite everyone to our future events. But if you come to Brussels, I think 
uh, our permanent exhibition is a very, very nice and enriching example of how this um, opposing and conflicting and um, memories can be dealt with in a in a safe and in a in a way that actually um, that makes people think and engage with them and does not um, does not um, increase the competition or the tension, but I think it's, it provides this space where we can um, release this this pressure while of course uh, getting to know some uncomfortable things because it's our history is full of that so that would be my my invitation at the end and thank you very much for this very nice conversation thank you so much simina also from my side rura misai well like simina i would like to thank you for the invitation and uh also to to add the the idea that you know wherever there is a Black Lives Matter or some version of in your local community to participate because when we are all free, you know, when one is free, when one is unfree, then we are not, all not free as Nelson Mandela famously said. So that it's important that, you know, participating in this, it's really also about sort of both deconstructing the old memory of Europe, but also constructing a new one. So participating in this uh, Black Lives Matter uh, versions of history is also another way of creating new memories and also an engaged and nuanced and, uh, and, and complex one. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Rura Misai. And again, last but not least, Michael. Yeah, I guess I'd say for me, one of the um, horizons for new memory work is uh, moving beyond a paradigm that I think has dominated a lot of our discussions of these questions, which is the paradigm of victims and perpetrators in a very binary mm -hmm. framework. And I think as we think about the European level and even the global level, we need more complicated understandings of how history works. And I think that involves in part moving beyond this paradigm, which in some ways comes from Holocaust memory of innocent victims and, and guilty perpetrators. Not mm -hmm. that those don't exist, but there are a lot of other people, right, who, who we want to also factor in. So I think new ways in, of engaging what I call implicated subjects, right, those who are neither victims nor perpetrators, but who may enable some of these forms of violence and trauma we've been talking about, or who in any case may inherit them. Right? So as the generations change in relation to a lot of these events, th this, the, the notion that we can assign people to two camps no longer works. Right, A lot mm -hmm. of people are in between or occupy multiple positions in these histories or gray zones in these histories. And I think it's evoking some of that complexity, some of those gray zones, some of these forms of implication and implicated subjects that I think is, is one of the, not the only certainly, but one of the important next steps for thinking about European history and memory. And it's thank you so part of the conversation. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael. And I think these were perfect final words. The only thing that remains to be done from my side is again to say a heartfelt thank you to our three speakers, their time and engagement, and to say thank you also to all those who have participated in today's debate online. Thank you so much and have a good remaining evening. Bye bye. <laughs>